Well, okay, we'll, we'll jump right in. So, um, welcome. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Kamal Hathi. I work on the Power BI team. And today presenting with me will also be uh, Patrick Baumgartner on the Power BI team. You'll see in a bit. And we're very fortunate to have um, Andrew from Cushman in Wakefield, who is a great customer of ours. And he'll actually come on stage as well. Uh, and along the way, we'll be talking about some really interesting things. So by way of context um, about me, I've been with the Microsoft BI platform, the, the whole BI uh, journey at Microsoft, uh, for a very long time. In fact, last Friday, the 23rd, was my 20th year at Microsoft. So I've been for a long time uh, in this business. Um, and um, so, all okay hearing-wise? The sound's okay, right? So somebody's signaling to me. Okay. So with that said, if I look back for, for those 20 years, the one thing I've heard again and again and again from everybody is that, oh, change is constant, the world's being transformed, you know, things are changing really quickly, et cetera. But it turns out that the last few years have been just last five, six years has been crazy as it comes to transformation. And if you go back a bit in time um, and look at, uh, clicker would work, and look at um, the S&P 500, Right, the S&P 500, that's the sort of club, if you will, for big companies. If you are in the S&P 500, you're a big, successful company, at least in the US, the US stock market, that's a, it's a big deal. And if you go back to the you know, turn of the last century, the 1920s, the beginning of the century, uh, if you were in the S&P 500, you pretty much were there forever. People assume that companies, big companies, never died. You know, they just there forever and ever and ever. If you go fast forward now to today, if you look at this chart, it's fascinating to see that about three-fourths of all the companies that are in the S&P 500 today will not be there in about 10 years or so, five, 10 years from now. And that's pretty astonishing if you think about it. I mean, if you think about large, big companies and the fact that they will just disappear. And so it's a time of transformation, and there are two kinds of companies. They are the transformed, and they are the transformees, right? A difference between a transform me and a transformer, if you will, is only one thing, uh, and that is data. Data is the one thing that makes the huge difference between how big new companies are really doing, you know, what, what they need to do to succeed, and, and those that are not. Uh, in fact, we are seeing traditional companies, manufacturers, people who make, you know, things like refrigerators, they are getting in the business of being a data company. They're selling uh, subscriptions to groceries for the data they collect. We're seeing car manufacturers talking about selling you, you know, driving lifestyles in a self-driving car where they're giving you news and data about who you are and really customizing you know, on, on, on your requirements and the data that they have about you. So data is becoming the one thing that's a difference between companies that are really succeeding and those who are not. In fact, there's so much data all over the place um, that inside Microsoft, for example, we talk about how we use this data in every single part of the company as a data culture. Right, the notion that everyone, line of business, hallelujah, there's light. <laughs> it's a sign. <laughs> I think I should, I should just leave at this point. Um, but you know, the, the notion of everyone, finance, HR, manufacturing, everyone using data to make, to make decisions is this notion of data culture. And the question comes in, how do you get to data culture? What needs to happen? You know, what is the, the kinds of things you need to do? We'll talk about that today. Uh, the thing that we believe really drives this notion of a data culture uh, is what we call this notion of a modern BI platform. And the shift to modern BI uh, has been something the industry has been going through. So we have had for a long time, and we still do in a sense, this notion of technical BI, or BI that is um, you know, corporate centralized BI. And that's still very much the case that we have today. Uh, and IT delivers solutions to end users, and users consume them. And you know, that, that's, a thing, that's a motion that goes on. We've had the notion, and we still have, the idea of self-service BI. And that's an ongoing thing as well. Everybody, light's going off again. I'm telling you this. There's a, I'm not sure it's a good thing or a bad thing now. Um, and this is the, the very analysts, people who are, uh, you know, know the data, that know it really well. They are the ones driving and delivering information to other uh, users, maybe even bypassing IT sometimes. And that's where most of the industry is at. That's where we have, you know, 
certainly with Excel, that's where Microsoft has been, with Tableau, ClickTech, all these other companies. It's all about self-service for the analyst. But the real change that we are driving, we believe it's important for a truly modern BI platform, is this notion of BI for everybody. Every single human being in the company, every person being able to get information and insights, and doing this, what we call the third wave of BI. And that's the, the, the transformation, the shift that enables you to get to this data culture. Now, the important part is that you know, this is not a replacement when you go from centralized corporate or technical uh, IT-led BI to analyst-led solution to what end users can do. But this is something that builds one upon the other. It's like this Russian doll model. You put one you know, inside the other, inside the other. It just builds up. And the notion, obviously, is that today, IT still delivers solutions that are super important. And central IT is, 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 is critical to success of BI in organizations. And analysts actually consume that information from, from central IT and deliver information to end users. And end users, in turn, consume information from all these different parts, as well as themselves are able to go to the data they need and get answers that for, for the insights they need to have. And so think about this layering building up uh, as being uh, the hallmark of a full, complete, end-to-end -end modern BI platform. Uh, many companies have bits and pieces. Very few, if any, have this full modern BI platform that addresses both the needs of the professionals as well as the end users in one complete uh, offering. So, the, the, so this is what we think is a modern BI platform, but from our point of view, the other thing that's really important is it's driven by another big shift in the world that's taking place, not just a shift in how BI or analytics is created and delivered, uh, but the shift to the cloud, uh, and, and specifically the shift uh, to SaaS-based computing. If you look at SaaS and the power of SaaS, um, software as a service, and you go back in time and look at Siebel, uh, Siebel software, and people remember Siebel? Anybody out here? Yeah, a few people. It's interesting that there's not enough even hands going up. Siebel was like the gold standard for doing customer relationship management, CRM, sales automation, right? Uh, and Oracle actually bought Siebel in 2004, 2005 for about $4 billion, right? $4 billion. Big transaction, big deal. Now, it was considered to be a, a hallmark of what happened. Because that time, you, you, to implement a Siebel solution, you needed to be somebody. You needed to be you know, a, a person with influence, you know, an IT CIO who had the project. Uh, you had needed to have consultants who came in and, and helped build the solution out. You could see a CRM system. You literally spent hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars building a Siebel solution. And then the end user, at the end of all that, came in and maybe, or maybe not, got some value out of it. Now, that was pretty good. If you fast forward today, right, to this particular time, and you talk about customer relationship management, sales automation. And the first name that comes to mind, of course, is Dynamic CRM, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> it's a Microsoft conference. What am I going to say? Right. Yeah, you're right. Salesforce tends to be the name that pops up, right? Any guesses on the valuation of Salesforce today? Come on. Somebody must have a guess. Look up this. It's about 60 to $70 billion. Siebel. Four billion dollars, Salesforce, 15, 16 times the valuation. Same exact business. There's no difference in what they do. Same exact business. So what changed? What is so different between these things? The difference is the following. With Dynamic CRM or Salesforce, the way you get value is you go to a website, you sign in uh, with a username and password, and boom, up and running. No IT required, no consultants required. No hardware, no millions of dollars. Stuff just works for you immediately. And that's the power of a SaaS solution, software as a service. And we have seen this across the board. We've seen this with uh, Zendesk. Uh, we've seen this with Marketo. We've seen this with um, uh, you know, MailChimp and all kinds of other places, QuickBooks Online. Solutions that deliver you value immediately as a business user, not requiring IT, not requiring analysts, on your own with your data, you can get value very, very, very quickly. That's the power of SaaS. Even in simple things such as sharing files, file shares, right? Usually that's how I still share my files. I'm an old guy. It's VAC, VAC, Kamal H, VAC Public, VAC My Files, VAC Don't Touch, VAC whatever. It's a long, huge thing, and I send it to somebody else. They go to the server and they get the file. Most people don't do that anymore. If you share files, everybody uses OneDrive, right, obviously. It's 
maybe Dropbox, some of you, you know, if you are. But this conference, I think, pretty safe to say OneDrive is, is, is very popular. Again, it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a cloud-based SaaS solution. You don't even think twice. Sharing is a link away. And you don't have to worry about servers, infrastructure, hardware, nothing. It just completely works. The one place this has not happened is with BI. You wonder why? I mean, it's a good question. And the reason is simple. BI is about data. And the data traditionally has been under lock and key. It's been in the SAP system, still is. It's on premises. It's on all kinds of custom solutions. The thing that's changing, though, is the other two red boxes. Data now is in SaaS solutions. It's in Salesforce. It's in CRM. It's in Marketo. It's in Google Analytics. It's available to the end user on their own account to connect and get at very easily. They don't need to go connect to proprietary solutions all the time. On top of that, Microsoft and others have enabled hybrid connectivity, ability to go from the cloud down to on-premises, go to secure sources with IT's blessing, get the data back up. And so now with that kind of a change, uh, BI is the same state as CRM was many years ago. And that's what we are doing with Power BI. Power BI, the reason we do it, this whole spiel is about to explain to you why we do have Power BI as a cloud service. What's the reasoning behind it? And the reasoning is, is simple. The approach is to do with Power BI pretty much what has happened to the rest of the SaaS market with other solutions. And, and that's our goal. That's what we want to do. Right? Disrupt the market, if you will, and make a change so that everybody, every user, every business user, every person in the organization can get insights on data without having to spend an arm and a leg on infrastructure or have influence with IT or other people. Enabling personal, you know, ubiquitous BI is what we want to do. So with that said, the question comes in is, how are we doing? Like, we, it's all big talk. What, is the, what are the results till now? Well, if you look at Power BI uh, and its journey, we went a GA, General Availability, in uh, July 24th of 2015. If you go back, it's about a year and, what, about three, four months. Since then, if you do the 15 months or so the, till, till, till then, this is where we are. Okay? So take a look at these numbers. Over 5 million subscribers. Okay? It's available in 210 countries. If you whip out your smartphone right now and do a search, countries in the world, you'll get back about, depending on which search engine you use, 187 or 190 countries. So 210 means... You know, protected territories, uh, or disputed territories, protectorates, all kinds of things. Anything that's not even officially a country in every corner of the world where there are human beings, you're running Power BI. It's in, you know, 200 plus, 1,000 plus organizations, all companies, 200,000 companies, large companies across the world using, uh, like Cushman and Wakefield, who we'll talk to soon, using Power BI. So it's massive adoption. And we have telemetry. We, we, we check. We know on a minute-to-minute-to-minute -minute -minute basis what the usage is. And that curve which shows us usage is like that. It's just straight up line. It's a very fast accelerating solution. That's important now. So if you haven't tried it or bet on it, join these other people and, and give it a shot. And Power BI is interesting because it's not just about data from Microsoft. It's obviously, we get data from our cloud but we get data from all other kinds of sources. We get it from, you know, we talked about Salesforce and Marketo and you know, Mark Comscore and Adobe. We announced Adobe today, Adobe, people like that, uh, as well as on-premises solutions. We connect to SAP HANA, we collect to Teradata, to Oracle, to DB2, to you name it, and we'll see that in a minute. And we pull together all the attributes that are required for a modern data solution. It's not just about niche charts and graphs and click and drill. It's about the kind of insights with streaming, with machine learning, all of those things come together with Power BI, and that's what it enables to do. With that said, um, we are not the only ones uh, who are saying it ourselves. Uh, different analysts across the world, Gartner, thank you for being here. Uh, same thing with uh, in their magic quadrant, uh, saying who's leading, who's not. You can very clearly see uh, that Microsoft is right there ahead of the pack. Uh, and, and doing really, really well. And that's pretty astonishing, uh, given where we have been over the past time and, and the evolution of, uh, of, um, of Power BI and Microsoft. So it's a, it's a good indication in general of how things are going. Now, with that said, I think the best way to talk about modern BI 
uh, is actually to show it to you in action. So I'll shut up with all the talk, and I will switch over to a machine here and try and do a demo for you uh, and, and show you how it works. All right, so uh, I need to go to machine number eight, it tells me. And machine number eight is here. And what we should see in a minute uh, is a dashboard. So this is a Power BI dashboard, OK? And a Power BI dashboard is a place where you collect all your information. You can do whatever you want. You can search. You can find. You can drill. You can, you can see data and visualizations in any form you want. In fact, this particular dashboard, similar example of this, I'll show that to you in a little bit and see how you yourself very easily can get at it and try it out. But let's say now, I, you know, um, besides looking at this, which is a predictive maintenance dashboard, you can see that actually the graph is moving in real time. It's actually you know, giving us sensor data that's coming in from a, from a jet engine. Um, let's say I want to go off and I'm in finance and I want to get information that I want to work with. How do I get started? It's pretty straightforward. I just go in here. I click on this thing. It says get data. And I have the different options. Again, you may have seen this. I'll be very quick about this. Is you can go in, and I won't repeat uh, how we get the data, but you can go in and get from you know, the SaaS services I mentioned. All kinds of over 60 services here that you can get data from, from all the way from MailChimp and Lithium and Marketo and obviously Dynamics and you, know, you name it. If you have data in some kind of a SaaS solution out there, either we already have it or it's coming very soon. The implication of this is simple. As a business user, as somebody who doesn't have the ability to stand up servers and the ability to go in and maybe even work with Excel spreadsheets or, or Tableau or whatever, I can just go to my SaaS provider, click Login, and literally in minutes have a solution uh, that I want to go work with. And that's possible for me to do uh, very easily. OK, so that's that. But let's say I want, to, I want to get data, I want to get started with information that is not just from a third party, but it's from my organization, my internal organization. So I can go here to this tab, click on it, uh, and it switches over to showing information that is uh, in my organization, uh, in, in this particular case, happens to be Microsoft. It's all kinds of things here. And in this scenario, I'm a person who wants to work with travel data, so I just go type in travel, and I see what is called a content pack that's been published by this guy, Patrick Baumgartner, who you'll see in a bit. Um, <clears throat> and this content pack is a collection of dashboards, reports, and data set, all bundled together into a solution that I can start using. Not raw data, not fields that I drag and drop and write calculations on, but a full, complete solution. So I go and, and say get. It actually goes off, connects to um, the service that's published it, and now it's importing the data, and it gets it in. And I can, if I go and look at my dashboards, uh, what I will see, and I can actually go and search for it, and say travel. Uh, I see this thing called travel analysis, and one called travel worries, but I'm worried about travel. And the thing to notice here is the following. This thing has been published by IT, so it's controlled, governed, et cetera. And I want to work on it myself. So I can go and make a copy of it. I do make a copy and I save the content pack uh, as a copy, and it, it comes across. And here it is, uh, this copy that I can go switch over to. And what, what I have here is a set of visualizations and, and, and metrics that talk about um, what I can do with, uh, with, with my travel data. And I'm going to refresh it a bit. Some of the connectivity is a bit slow here. Um, that's the, the downside of using shared Wi-Fi sometimes. But you can see out here, there's all kinds of information about you know, cost per mile and advanced booking. And this dashboard is fully interactive. I can go say, hey, show me the analysis of out-of-policy travel. And I can see that in a minute. And I can say, you know, um, I can go and see internal versus external. I can drill. And the entire dashboard is fully interactive. I can also go in and see this interesting visual that I have here uh, that I want to work with. And um, let me just do this for a bit. And I can go and. Um, zoom in, in what we call in focus mode, and it shows me information here. I can go and, and uh, move things out. And I can start doing things like sorting. I can sort by average trip length, for example. So I can see, hey, Tel Aviv, Israel is fairly popular for guys who are in Microsoft. This data, by the way, is sort of a, um, not real, but almost real data from Microsoft. We have mass most information, but you can see that you know, it gives an ex example of what Microsoft travel looks like. And you can see things like you know, cross per mile, and, and we can sort, sort by that or number of trips. But I also have on top here this thing called Get Insights. If I go click on that, 
what it does is the following. Remember, I'm a business guy. I have no idea about you know, how to go off and write DAX or SQL or some script. So what's happening here is the following. You see this, this charts populating down here? Uh, and you can see some of this description in text below it. Power BI went in and used machine learning algorithms to automatically analyze the data. It does clustering, exception analysis, outliers, and it finds interesting data and information that I can work with. And I see interesting things in here. And if I start looking, uh, things like business class has noticeably more trip length, which makes sense. It's kind of common sense. Big companies let you fly business class on long trips. And you can see other things out here about you know, cost per mile is more in business and trip length, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but as I go down further, I find one interesting metric pop, uh, pop up here. It says Monte Carlo uh, Monaco has more cost per mile than any other, which is interesting. So people are flying to Monaco and it's costing a lot of money. If I go actually click on this, Um, it drills across, and you can see that the Monaco cost per mile is like way more than anything else out there. It's massively large. So now as a user, I found an interesting tidbit just by using the built-in automated discovery of data that, uh, that we provide with Power BI. Now I can do more. I can go back out of this, and Power BI provides this thing called Q&A, which is our natural language search. So I can start doing things like, I want to know about my, my, about my travel data. So I can say, you know what, tell me something about travel. I can say something like, you know, number... Uh, of miles, and you can see things like uh, that we, Microsoft in this simulation has traveled more than 2.7 billion miles. It's like to the moon and back a few times. It's a lot of frequent fire miles. I believe Satya gets a private jet because of that. Um, but with that said, let's say I want to go in and ask questions uh, about uh, what we just saw about this whole Monte Carlo thing. So I could say things like uh, cost per mile, and it's about 26 cents is the average cost per mile. But if I say cost per mile uh, to uh, MCM, which is the destination airport, and I see it's $25 is a cost per mile. It's about you know, 100 times more expensive to travel to, to Monte Carlo. So why is that so? Again, I can just ask. I'm a business guy. I don't know how to go and, and, and write queries. I just ask questions. And we say, you know what? Break it down by carrier. I can do that. And I see that what you see is something interesting, right? See this thing here? Can anybody see this? It's Heli Air Monaco. It turns out people are taking helicopter rides to Monaco uh, from a place called Nice. It's no wonder it's so expensive. Now imagine doing this as, as, a, as a user. Be able to go in, quickly find information, and then drill in and find something that was completely hidden in the data. And that happened uh, very, very easily here. I can even go in and do things like you know, travel summary. As I, as I do that, it shows me a report, a full report that I can go work with. And I can filter the report. I can pass parameters to it by saying to uh, MCM, which is the Monaco airport that I talked about. And you can see uh, when I do that, um, that literally I can have information. The, here's the Heli Air Monaco. You can see in this map, actually, that uh, the, it's going from Nice to France. And, and, this, and the two cities are so close by, you can't even see it carefully uh, in, the, in, in this here. Now, when I'm done with this, I can say, this is interesting. I like this information. I want to pin it to a dashboard and go and pin the visual, which means I can go in. Um, oh, I, I didn't make a copy of the, of the thing, so I should go back. Sorry about that. Um, the point being, I can go in and start making copies, uh, making, collecting information that I, that I find in the so example here. This is the one I want to work with. So what happened here to understand is, instead of working on the copy I made for my personal use, I was working on the corporate version. And that's why I couldn't go off and collect data. So it sort of was a safeguard around it. And we'll talk about enterprise features more. This is an example how IT can limit what people can do and collect information. For this copy of this, I can do the same thing. I can go and say, you know, travel summary um, to MCM, maybe. And if I like that, I take it. Uh, and then I can go and say, pin this visual, and I can go pin it um, to any dashboard I want. Maybe I didn't do it right again. So the point making, uh, making is that for some reason it's having trouble pinning things. That's okay. We don't worry about that right now. But you can take any information you want and just go in and say, you know, just pin it. I like this guy. I could have said, you know, information here, pin it, 
Uh, and again, if we just gone and pinned it, which dashboard you want, I would have said, I'll, you know, I have an existing dashboard I want to do. Uh, it's called Travel Worries. I go and pin to that and say pin. And maybe I like this guy here, and I can say, you know, same thing, uh, pin it um, to that dashboard. And I can go in and, and pin that. Again, the same thing to the uh, Worries dashboard that I had, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. And so now if I go in and look at my Travel Worries dashboard, uh, what you will see is that I've got uh, the thing that I collected available for me, and I can go look at. And I've got this cost per mile. I can say, OK, share it to the rest of my organization. I can go in and type in you know, Pat uh, B, Patrick Baumgartner, and I can see Patrick's name pops up. And it's fully integrated with my Active Directory, fully integrated with my over system. I can go and share it very, very simply. So that's you know, very quick and easy to do. One last thing to show you here is that not only can I do this uh, on, my, um, on my Windows PC, but I can actually switch over and see this uh, in my iPhone. This is my iPhone here, and I'm allowed to use an iPhone, it turns out. Um, and you can go in and I can go and you know, search uh, for travel maybe, this travel analysis thing. I can go open it up, and the same uh, thing is there. I won't take too much time in, in loading up and all that, but you, you can get the idea. I can, you can have the um, other ones that I did recently, the aircraft one, and that shows up uh, in here as well. Uh, it's a bit slow with the Wi-Fi. It takes time to, to load it up. But you get the idea. It's all fully integrated. Uh, I can go work on, uh, on the dashboard on my, on my laptop, say share. shows up to anybody who wants. They go in there uh, into their um, mobile device and up and running. They are with information uh, literally at their fingertips. So that's that um, in terms of quickly showing you this notion of modern BI, what it can do, et cetera. I'm going to switch back to slides. And before we uh, go on further, uh, talk about a few things there. So I hope I'll get my slides back. I do. And the, the quick recap then, of course, is this notion that modern BI is not just about you know, boring all charts and, and graphs and, and slicing and dicing, but the notion that you can do automated discovery with machine learning, with you know, insights that are built in for you. You can use natural language. You can have streaming data. Uh, you can have these experiences that are you know, very new and modern. All these put together for anybody in the enterprise to go and work with. Okay? Now, with that said, uh, this all becomes useful and, and, and really, really impactful when you couple it with features and capabilities that allow BI to be spread in the, in the enterprise uh, quickly, safely, with the governed way, uh, in, in a high-impact fashion. And many companies across the world are using Power BI in that fashion. They are, they'll have thousands and thousands of people in their organizations using Power BI, and they're doing it in a governed, managed fashion, as enterprises like to do. So in order to show you that in action, uh, Patrick is going to join us, and he's going to do a demo uh, of Power BI running and with enterprise capabilities uh, that we believe uh, are very, very important uh, for large companies to work with. So Patrick, show us um, what you're going to show us. Great. Oh, making me get my mic. my mic on. You're Patrick, you're not Mike. Yeah. That's OK. Let me get, uh, switch over to number seven here. All right, so uh, if you guys are familiar with the Power BI team uh, at all, you've seen we've been moving incredibly fast. And I was actually laughing because we, when we put this demo script together, we went through all the features. And uh, I forgot to remind them all to show our new alerting feature. And I'm oh. like, you know, we're, we're having trouble keeping up with our own uh, feature velocity. And uh, one of the things. One second, your mic's not properly on, it seems. Now Can I'm you on. please turn his all mic right. on? No, I'm on. Is all it right. on now? OK, I don't know what you just heard, but I'll just keep going. Mike is moving up. All right, we only have two mics, we have three presenters, so I got to switch right after this. So we're getting our mics all sorted out here. Um, so, what I was saying is. Um, Hopefully what Kamal just showed you guys uh, is that uh, Power BI is a really fun, easy to use, uh, and amazingly powerful user experience for business users. And what we've seen is this amazing growth in the number of people using our service, uh, even as just business users coming to PowerBI.com and getting going very quickly. But to be able to do that and feel really good about a Power BI deployment, you have to have an enterprise-ready platform that allows you to control what people are doing, uh, have auditing, monitoring, security, all these features that make a really robust uh, data uh, deployment. So uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look at some of those capabilities and really understand the All platform right. that's going on here. So I'm going to switch over to uh, Power BI Desktop. We're actually looking at the same content uh, that uh, Kamal was just uh, uh, demoing for you. 
And what I want to actually start, uh, start with, if you're not familiar with Power BI uh, Desktop, uh, one of the kind of first key things you'll, you'll learn about this tool is it can connect to a ton of data sources. And, and uh, so you'll see here we actually now have more individual data connectors than either of, uh, of our biggest competitors. Uh, and we're really, really proud of the speed at which we're letting you connect to your data. Everything from online services, uh, whenever we publish one of these online services, uh, we bring that down to the desktop. So you want to connect directly to Salesforce. Uh, you wanted to connect directly to QuickBooks Online. This is a great way to do custom data connections and data uh, analysis. Everything from Azure to traditional data sources to just bringing in files and CSVs. And built on top of this is a thing called Power Query with an amazing ETL set of capabilities. So hopefully you'll find some sessions to get to learn more about those tools as well. So moving on here, what you'll see is uh, analysts can use this to build incredibly rich reports. And then what I want to take you through is the stack going up from those reports all the way to an enterprise uh, uh, robust deployment. And so one of the first things you have to do uh, is be able to secure your data. So in here, you can see we've set up a bunch of different roles based off of regions. And this is really based off of how we do things with travel data at Microsoft. So we have different management groups around the world. So we have APAC as an example. And I can go in here and basically set up a very basic filter that says, hey, look, only people in the APAC manager's role can see data for APAC. And so right here uh, in Power BI, I can just say view roles as and just get a quick sample of what this is going to be when I publish it to the service. And so now when I publish to the service and I assign the security group for the APAC managers to this and then they get the content pack, they get the data, it's uh, um, security trimmed just to them uh, in the way that you would expect. Uh, additionally, if I had data in AS on premise, I can apply my security there and keep your data secure in any way that you like. So let's switch up now and look at some of the service. Um, if I come here, um, I can go ahead and publish this. Uh, and when I publish it, I can publish it either in my workspace or into a work group. And we're going to switch over to an account here, take a look at some of this. So workspaces allow you to have uh, multi-user editing and control your data. That's uh, where we publish that content pack from. So that's one level of, of control. But I also want to now move in and take a look at our admin dashboard. Uh, so if I come into my administration portal here, you'll start seeing some of the, the uh, features we have that let you feel really good about your Power BI deployment. So first is usage metrics. And this is, I can't actually, it turns out Microsoft has nine worldwide tenant admins. I am not one of those. Uh, and so what I'm looking down here is uh, one of my specific tenants uh, that we use for some demo purposes. And I can keep track of the number of users, what they're looking at, what are the popular data sets, what are the popular dashboards, and really understand what people are doing with this data. Um, additionally, we have a full set of tenant settings now that we've been working really hard on as a Power BI team to make sure you can control things like external sharing, uh, control uh, use of, of R scripts, and some different things that you may or may want to enable uh, as an IT administration level, all the way down to here that you can actually provide default classifications for dashboards. This was something we had to do internally to Microsoft. It's very heavily used. So every time I have a dashboard in Power BI, you can see this is LBI, low business impact data. So we can keep things tagged appropriately. So from an <laughs> IT administration uh, place, I can understand what data is where. So moving forward, I can also come here uh, and check out our full auditing capabilities. So Power BI provides a full <laughs> auditing. It's integrated right in with uh, um, Office 365's auditing capabilities. This was big feedback to us that people wanted to see all this information in one place. So if I come in here, I can look just for, say, the Power BI uh, activities. And let me click here. Run my search. Run my search. Let's do my all my activities. And in here, we have all of the activities down to who viewed what dashboard, who viewed what data set. So I have a full set of auditing and compliance controls. And to go one step further, we're fully integrated in, in the Azure Management Console, so I can control for Power BI things like two-factor authentication and mobile uh, device management, which um, what we're seeing now for Power BI, uh, and if we come back to the uh, initial conversation we had with Kamal, we have this explosive growth amongst a ton of organizations using Power BI. And what we're seeing following behind that is a lot of large, very uh, large deployments inside of enterprise really deploying Power BI uh, uh, broadly across the organization. And these uh, uh, integration with Office 365, uh, integration with the, the audit logs, uh, and things like mobile uh, um, device management are really empowering organizations to really expand their Power BI deployments. And so if you have one takeaway from this presentation, uh, it's that we're ready to go on that front. I want to show one other thing, though. I'm going to switch back to Power BI Desktop. I have one more demo we're going to do a little bit sure, go further in the session, but I want to get in a couple <clears throat> features. 
So, uh, every month we update Power BI Desktop. Over the next three months, you're going to see a ton of reporting and or a new advanced analysis capabilities coming into Power BI Desktop. I wanted to give you a quick preview of a few of those. Um, what I did prior to this demo was kind of travel theme. So, we took uh, the last couple years of travel delays that the FAA uh, publishes every month. So, this is actually looking at all the delays for the last two years for all the domestic flights in America. So, I could do something, turns out Hawaiian Airlines uh, has on average. Uh, the top on-time performance rating. And I can see down here um, how often, across all these flights, people are either delayed or early. This is the average thing. This is, of course, kind of rear view looking. How great would it be to be able to just really quickly get a forecast of what's going to happen next? So you'll see here uh, in our analysis uh, task pane a bunch of new analysis capabilities that are starting to appear. One of them is the ability just to come in and do a quick forecast. So maybe I want to do a forecast of uh, 30 you know, data points 30 days into the future. Let's hit apply. And I've got a confidence interval, and I can just see uh, immediately uh, very sophisticated forecasting <coughs> algorithms. Again, this so, is. So, this gray thing here is, is the future forecast. Yeah, the, and, and the, the blue the, thing is the past. Yeah, this is the past, and this is the future. So, if I see a few days out, um, I can get a sense of how my flight's going to do. Maybe I want to just uh, filter down. Um, let's look at just the flights where the destination is in, in Washington, which is where I'm flying back to. And let's see, Atlanta to Seattle. You know, I can get a quick forecast. Uh, that it looks like my flights, you know, based off of historical performance, is probably going to be on time. And so some uh, pretty cool functionality there. And also in terms of distributing this inside of my organization. So I can even now, uh, a feature that uh, uh, we're pretty excited about, we, we, we acquired a company called DataZen uh, uh, last year, and bringing the uh, uh, concept that they had from their uh, product, which is mobile device, uh, mobile report layouts, which means that now when I have uh, that layout of that report, uh, I, don't, I can just have... Um, specific mobile views for that. So uh, as Kamal showed his, his mobile device, uh, when he picks that up, if he loads this dashboard, it'll render specifically to him uh, um, on that mobile phone, because I might want to control which specific subset of data uh, that I lay out and how I lay it out here in this grid view. So the important thing, though, is that if you don't do this, you still get a great mobile experience. By doing this, you get even more control. It's all about more control and how you want to go present things. But there's a you know, vanilla one which is automatically adjusts itself. And so finally, just one last uh, thing um, just to make sure you're aware of. If I come back here into the service, um, we also have full alerting capabilities. So I can come on uh, once I get all this data deployed out to my users, and I can set up alerts on my data very easily and get quick notifications. It's a very fast way uh, to stay on top of the data that matters most to me. So I'm going to be back in a few minutes to do uh, another demo, but I think we have a, a yeah. customer coming on stage next. What, 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 hold on. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Fantastic. Um, so. Before we get um, Andrew on stage with us, um, I'm going to switch over to the slides for a couple of minutes more. And when you talk about compliance, uh, this is a very big, important part of an enterprise solution. It's important to know that, that Microsoft has spent a lot of time and continues to spend a lot of time on getting all these compliance certifications uh, for our cloud service. So we are ISO compliant, HIPAA, EU model clause, if you happen to live in Europe, that's a very important piece uh, to go off and, and have uh, certifications for. And all these are there, and there are many more coming, and we continuously keep doing this. Once again, from an enterprise point of view, it is super important that you have a vendor and you have a solution that you can actually deploy across the world. You can have uh, you know, it available for the kinds of industries that you need to, and we're making sure that, that you indeed do. OK. A couple more things here. Uh, we talked about ent uh, the enterprise. And one important piece about the enterprise that we get asked a lot about is on-premises. What happens when I want not, not be in the cloud only? What happens on-premises? So quickly, uh, besides these interesting and important things that our enterprise solutions provide, you know, modeling, security, et cetera, uh, is the notion that uh, we allow you to have your BI solution, what we say, on your terms. So this chart is kind of interesting. It has to be parsed, if you will, and let me walk you through. So the solution can have three parts to it. There's modeling. There's obviously create data model, uh, authoring of reports, and analysis you might do, data discovery, and then how we consume and deliver it to end users. So for the modeling and authoring piece, we rely on analysis services quite heavily. It's a semantic model server, if you will. And it's available on premises, as you all know, but Power BI connects very easily from the cloud to the on-premises analysis services almost transparently. You, as a user, never feel any lag, any delay. This thing just works if set up right. Uh, the security is 
easily mapped in. All you have to do is have Active Directory uh, running uh, on-premises, and, and obviously if you have Azure Active Directory, which we do with Power BI, uh, we automatically make sure that these credentials are mapped and passed through, and you just get the same exact access rights as you would have on-premises. So it's very transparent and works very, very well. Um, Analysis services also just happens to be running behind the covers in Power BI, but that's you know, not particularly important from a user point of view. For, for the, so from that point of view, you can really invest and not worry about um, you know, what will happen to your on-premises investments when you use Power BI in the cloud. From an authoring point of view, Power BI Desktop and Excel obviously both are running on a desktop. Uh, they're running you know, anywhere you want it to, and so that's easily uh, symmetrical on and off-premises. When it comes to consumption, delivery of reports, uh, right now, what I just showed and what Patrick was talking about, all of it is in the top there. It delivery is through the cloud service, through Power BI. I showed you connect to mobile's uh, you know, device, connecting to a browser. But we also have the ability today to deliver reports and reporting services on premises. In fact, if you pick up your Power BI mobile client, the first question we ask you is, do you want to connect to Power BI in the cloud? or do you want to connect to reporting services on-premises? And that's the current uh, approach we provide. And very soon, uh, what we are going to do is allow Power BI reports that are built in the Power BI desktop to be published to reporting services on-premises, so that, again, you have a choice of publishing to the cloud or publishing on-premises, and you can consume them with a browser or a phone very, very easily. So that will take care of a lot of the questions we get about on-premises and how do I leverage it. So really the goal we have is to have a symmetrical solution on and off-premises, hybrid in nature that you can go across as you wish uh, and work with all of these things together very simply. So with that said about the enterprise, what I want to do now uh, is welcome Andrew from Cushman and Wakefield uh, onto the stage. And uh, Andrew is a great customer of ours. Uh, he works with Cushman and Wakefield. He's the director of technology out there and, and runs most of their, you know, all their BI and analytics and, and those kinds of things. And Andrew has spent a lot of time working with Power BI. And so, Andrew, uh, it would be great if you can show us a bit about what you've been doing with Andrew and, uh, right. with, uh, uh, Cushman and Wakefield with Power BI. Right. And so, uh, while you get set up, let me switch you over. Yep. Uh, and this is number seven, I believe. And so tell us uh, something about your solution, what you've done. Right. So just to give, for those who don't know what Cushman and Wakefield yes, is, please. so we are a real estate company, I think one of the largest, if not the, the top two. Um, so starting from the chairman to the CEO to the global CIO to my boss, who's the global um, technology director, ultimately our aim is to make sure that every employee and all of our customers have access to some form of analytics. Which, which is quite important because when you have access to analytics, you make better decisions. Um, so now with this, there are two issues. We have, one is adoption. Another one is, of course, being able to visualize things the way you want. So uh, from an adoption perspective, uh, one of our uh, aim is to make sure that every employee who has an email address has access to analytics. Obviously, every employee who has access to email will be using Outlook. And if you are subscribed for Office 365, definitely you will have access to that. And obviously, if, if you use Office 365, you get Power BI as part of it. So adoption is very, very easy. That's good, yeah. So Great. that's one thing which we, we have cool. seen. Another one is, if you know Excel, it's pretty easy to use Power BI. That's right. And I think, I, I don't know, I mean, if, if I'm yet to find somebody who can tell me that, you know, that they have not used Excel. That's right. Excel and Power BI are like peas in a pod. Correct. So that's one side of it. And then once you have access, you, you must also make sure that people, not on an operational level, but at least on a tactical or strategic level, have the right visualization, the right uh, access to data. And I think things like Q&A, uh, using uh, custom visuals where you can do whatever practically you want, is certain things which... which Fantastic. Is, is, is Maybe you can see some of it? Yeah, so some of the things we have done is what you see here. So here you, 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 you see, uh, we being in the real estate business, for this particular customer, we have actually mapped all their properties, and you know you can click through and, and get some details as to you know okay here's the building you can just click through that get more details you can then go to a particular building there from that building you can go to a particular meeting room and see more information as you know your energy usage and things like that <clears throat> you can see okay in a building you get assets right you get um, 
lifts, you get air conditions and various yeah. things. So if I want to see by uh, my assets, I can then again go through and I can see this one being very high, so that's something to do with property and building. So I can just go there, I can click that off. I, like that I can get more uh, detailed uh, analysis. I can even go sh shorten the time frame for which I want to view the whole thing and, and get information like that. Uh, another one we have done is, um, if I'm managing a portfolio. Oh, what is that? Is that a 3D map or something? That's right. This? So, uh, of course, we have used Google Maps, yeah. not Bing Maps. That's okay. <laughs> and using Chrome as well. I don't know. That's right. And like of course, I okay. use Chrome. Yeah. So, uh, the idea here is, okay, I, I want to see, okay, the things which are red, uh, my, my, in my portfolio, these are flows which are not occupied. And things which are in green, I can click through and see. These are, uh, so one second. So this 3D map actually is a Power BI visualization. That's right. It's, a it's not just some Google map thing. No, no, no. It is an actual 3D visualization of your real estate buildings. That's right. As you click on those buildings, it cross filters to your charts. Correct. And you actually are seeing these things in the context Correct. of your real estate holdings. That's right. That's right. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Uh, and um, another uh, wonderful thing is that as a company, we have decided that internally we use Power BI software as a service using Office 365. Yeah. And for customers, they have a choice. They can, if they are part of Office 365, they can log in using the normal Power BI. But then if they don't, yeah. they can then look at uh, uh, embedded. So another example where we have used Power BI embedded is you log into the portal. So it's an external facing portal for customers. Correct. They come in, they log in. Yep. And you can then. Um, look at your dashboards and reports and uh, get more. And so the idea there really is that instead of having you use Power BI, you embedded the Power BI Correct. capabilities into the portal that you have. Correct. Uh, and hopefully we can connect to the portal, but if we can't, you would see Power BI running in this portal uh, embedded Correct. inside your uh, applications uh, directly. Correct. Okay. Well, let's see if this comes up or not, but as I said, we have some connectivity ch challenges yeah, going on. That's right. Uh, but it's okay. Yeah. Uh, Good enough, I would say. So, Andrew, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Very, very nice of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. If you think about it, um, here we have a, a very you know, large real estate company, one of the biggest in the world. And what they've done is pretty astonishing. They've taken, you saw that the 3D visual of their real estate. And what's happening is that, that their business is working with data in the mental image they have, they think about buildings, they think about how you know, real estate goes up and down, that's how they're using it. And that's the difference between a modern BI solution and a legacy one. You don't do pie charts and line charts only, you can do these beautiful renditions that you do. With that said, uh, really important uh, that Power BI is actually you know, not just a, uh, a tool, but it's a full platform. It's open, it's extensible. You can go in and you can do pretty much any kind of visual you want. Uh, you can go in and deliver custom visualizations. And in fact, one that you, that you saw from Kushman and Victor is an example. Another one, which I'm very, very, very happy to announce today, uh, is that uh, Esri, Esri is the leader in um, you know, geospatial analysis in GIS. Esri is delivering uh, their ArcGIS maps inside Power BI. And we, we are today announcing a preview uh, of the ArcGIS maps of Power BI. It'll be in the product soon. Uh, in fact, we've got folks from Esri sitting up front right now. And what I want to do is, instead of just talking about it, is have Patrick come back up and actually show us these Esri maps running inside Power BI, an example of this geospatial intelligence. Thank you. OK, great. So uh, it's almost a shame. Uh, I don't know if these blurry displays really do it justice, uh, but what you've seen now uh, is with the Power BI platform, creating custom visuals, as we saw with Cushman and Wakefield, and the visual that we're uh, creating in partnership with Esri, uh, you know, really allow people to visualize data in uh, very exciting ways specific to their need. And so we're going to do a demo here, and I'm going to play the role of a, an insurance uh, adjuster who's trying to understand the risk portfolio for a bunch of different policies that I've assigned. And so if I come to my report here, what this is, uh, if we can see, is a list of addresses. And if I'm thinking about how I want to visualize these addresses, you know, mapping is a very natural way to do that. I want to see spatially how it relates to different hazards in the environment uh, and, and try to understand my portfolio in that way. And so what you'll see uh, in an upcoming release in, in a pre under the preview switch in Power BI uh, is a new Esri ArcGIS uh, data visualization. 
And so uh, you'll still have the default Power BI mapping, uh, but this one might have just a few more capabilities as you're going to see. And by a few, I mean a ton. Uh, so right out of the box, you can see just the ability just to uh, lasso select, um, and I'm off to the races. And I still get the cross filtering uh, uh, across the, the Power BI report, but now I have this really uh, uh, robust map visualization to go, go with it. So let's take a look at some of the capabilities we have here as I dig into this scenario of trying to understand, you know, what's my, my risk uh, pro portfolio uh, um, for my uh, insurance policies here. So I'm going to go in, you'll see this little edit button that allows me to go in and access a full set of specific formatting and data analysis capabilities to really customize this map to my needs. So first, right off the bat, um, if I want to change the background mapping layer, I'm, I've got this default gray canvas. Um, I can use uh, the uh, uh, out of the box Esri ArcGIS mapping. Maybe I want to use open street maps, or maybe I want to get connected with my inner astronaut here and go for the kind of cool black theme. And what you get here is all of the different types of um, um, a mapping uh, and formatting capabilities to really get the uh, visualization down to what is going to make the information pop for your users uh, inside your organization. So maybe I have uh, users that are going to understand data a little bit better as a heat map. So this shows the density of these different, different plots. Um, maybe there's too many data points and I want to get an in, you know, out of the box just kind of clustering to help me understand uh, the bigger numbers of where this data is. Um, so I have all of that control. All the way down to if I want to control the different styles for each of these symbols. Uh, you know, maybe I want to have, have red with a green outline uh, and make sure everybody can see the data really well. Um, finally, and I think this is where we get some of the, the, the most uh, um, really uh, uh, amazing capability here in addition to just the, the, the uh, incredibly accurate mapping uh, that Esri provides. Um, but I can switch over here now and look at the reference layers provided by uh, Esri Maps. And so just out of the box, I don't have to geek out and understand um, how to mash data together or how to find it. Just out of the box, I can come here and say, maybe I just want to see uh, average household income by county, right? And I can think about uh, just being able to overlay that on the map or underlay it in this case and be able to uh, narrow down uh, what, where's the wealth coming from in my portfolio um, and, and how does that relate to the different policies I have. But in, in, in addition to this curated set uh, of map layers, uh, there's also uh, the uh, community uh, uh, set of uh, map letter layers in ArcGIS. Since I'm looking at Florida here and I'm thinking about insurance policies, obviously one of the big concerns I have is uh, hurricane season uh, and hurricanes coming in. So maybe I want to look at something like storm uh, surge. And I can see that uh, from the community, there's actually reference layers here that provide uh, open uh, um, the ability to see how these uh, storm surges line up. And I'm going to go back so I can see some stuff cross filter now. And um, you know, what's kind of interesting here is if I zoom in, I can see there's actually three policies right here on the edge of this. It's really hard to tell. Are they inside of this region, outside of that region? Well, these layers are actually fully interactive. So I'm going to click here, and now I can actually cross-highlight. It turns out there's only one policy in this really, uh, this is the highest storm surge, I think, based off of 2005 storms. Uh, but I can now use this as a, a, a way to quickly cross-highlight uh, and understand groups of data. Now, Again, the great thing about Esri is they have an incredibly robust, obviously, if you're into GIS and you're into geospatial analysis, you know, Esri is the, the, the best in the game. Uh, and so I can go and now customize this to my specific business, as I'm sure uh, many of your businesses obviously are. Now, again, this fully cross filters. So I've got all the great integration with the freeform reporting package. And we think by creating, uh, taking this level of mapping technology, uh, putting it one click access right in Power BI to all our users, uh, we can really extend some of these advanced concepts to even more users right out of the box. Now, this is a great example of how uh, a partner uh, of ours has, has uh, embedded with Power BI uh, and, and let extended Power BI uh, for all of you. Uh, and uh, obviously, if you wanted to build custom visuals like we saw with Cushman and Wakefield, that's a, a, another great way to kind of supercharge your Power BI deployment. So with Sounds that, good. thank you. Come on. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. So that's... So really, to repeat and stress, Power BI is a full platform. You can go in and embed it. You can extend it. You can write data uh, access uh, content packs and sources for it. You can pretty much do anything you want with Power BI. You saw what with Cushman and Wakefield. And the fact of working with Esri, you know, there's no way on earth Microsoft uh, really is going to be at the same level of depth and sophistication in the mapping business as Esri is. They, this is what they do for the living. It's their bread and butter. So instead of trying to go off and cobble together solutions that are you know, incrementally getting better with mapping, we did this, the best possible thing, which is we got the leader in mapping to deliver 
uh, their maps inside Power BI. And that way, the customer has a choice and is able to get what they need uh, at the best possible level instead of trying to use something that you know, we are uh, innovating on uh, maybe much slower than, than what Esri might be able to do. And this is very different than what you might get with our competitors who end up giving you what's in their box. What you get is what you get. And if you, I mean, if you don't like what they have, you're stuck. There's nothing else you can do. Not so with Power BI. With Power BI, the box that we provide you is just, just the beginning. Now you can extend it yourself, or we are going to work with these kinds of leading partners to extend our capabilities so that you, the customer, get the best of all possible worlds and have a solution that truly is modern and growing and meets your needs all the time. So with that said, one more aspect of a modern solution that's really important to us is this notion of getting started quickly, removing the friction that exists, if at all, uh, in how you work with, with uh, getting your data inside solutions started. So the most important thing here, of course, is the people who are trying to get going, get started, uh, as, as Andrew told us and Cushman and Wakefield, are pretty much anybody who has an email address. You are in an organization, you want to get started, you don't want to go to IT and request this and request that. You want to on your own to be able to get started fast and make progress. So for that, um, what we are going to talk about very quickly now is this notion of what we can do inside Power BI uh, to help you get started very, very quickly. So this is, I'm back to, to, to my, um, the dashboard that I was showing before that I shared. And if you go to powerbi.com, right, how many people have been to the site? I suppose everyone knows this, right? Yellow, nice and, did you get your Power BI yellow bags? I hope you did, didn't get those orange or green or, or blue, but yellow is good. Um, but this site is not just a marketing site. It provides you uh, an insight into uh, how you can very quickly get going with Power BI. The fastest thing, of course, is you go in and get started. You can download uh, the Power BI desktop. You can sign into the service with, you know, very quickly with your username and email address. But if you want to learn once you get started, we have a full page on learning. It gives you guided learning. You can go in, and it gives you minute-by-minute minute breakdown on which topic takes how much time, you know, literally getting started. It's five minutes for using Power BI, four minutes for that. Um, it gives you a full breakdown uh, as well on samples, documentation, our blog. We have a full uh, online course that you can take with Power BI to, to edX to get certified using that. Uh, we also provide you the ability to go to partners if you want to do a solution you want to deploy. We have over you know, 1,500 partners who run what we call the red carpet program. And you can see that they're in different countries. They work in different industries. You can actually go in and see their solutions in action. You can actually go in and learn uh, and see their solutions running fully uh, in a report that's fully interactive uh, inside the Power BI uh, website itself. You don't need to sign in. You don't need to you know, do anything. It's fully interactive reports you can try out. Uh, and play with and get an idea of how Power BI works. And you can see what this partner is capable of and then contact them uh, and help them help you. If you want to build solutions on your own, we have different examples of solutions. Uh, the industry ones are, are interesting. Uh, in fact, the one that I was showing before, the airline one, uh, you can go in yourself and you can try it out uh, with this report. It's very similar to the one that I had on my screen. Go check it out, try it out. There's a custom visual uh, of a jet engine that you can play with. Uh, but you can all this, all this without ever even signing into Power BI. If you want to go in and actually build solutions on your own uh, and want to do it rapidly and quickly, we provide these things called the solution templates. And the solution templates are about 70% finished solutions. We have them for CRM integration, for system center, this thing called brand management for Twitter. Um, and in fact, Patrick will show us in action in a bit, where you can basically take it and hook it up um, between the Twitter feed uh, using um, what we call Logic Apps, which is a workflow solution from Microsoft. You can just go in and, and say install now. It actually takes you through all these different parts and pieces, uh, puts it into a SQL database uh, in Azure with your credentials, and then gives you a finished uh, Power BI desktop file with all the beautiful visuals hooked up together. And so, for example, the, the output of that, of that solution template um, you want to show it? Okay. Yeah. So Patrick says, not me, but he, he's going to show us what it looks like. So go for it. If I can get my mic. If we can get the other mic going. If we can get In, the other mic going. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. It's okay. I needed to get on stage and get the full hat trick for demos. So as you, you can tell, I love this product. It's the most fun product I've ever worked on. 
Uh, it's for features just like this. This is kind of like if you've worked in BI for a while uh, and, and you've always been like, God, what if I could just get Twitter data and start partying on it and have custom visuals and do all this great stuff? And there's always been these steps in the way. Well, it turns out solution templates, uh, we're using this for a bunch of different industries. There's, there's four that have released now, uh, but helps kind of break down all these different barriers to advanced analysis. So I, as kind of a BI pro guy, can really go, go and do some great stuff. And so what Kamal showed you is there's a, a nice little wizard here for getting started. And we use the Twitter one because it's kind of easy for everybody to understand. Uh, there's also one for Salesforce for Dynamics. There's uh, solution templates coming up for SAP and a bunch of other common data sources and specific problems. But the Twitter one is all about being able to monitor tweets and maybe doing some brand management. Running through this takes like 15 minutes, so it's probably not worth trying to demo on stage. But here you can see is really literally the hour right before this session. I went through and ran through. Uh, this whole wizard, I provided an Azure subscription and I provided a Twitter account. That's all I had to do. And what that did behind the scenes is it deployed logic apps to go fetch tweets from Twitter. It deployed a database. It deployed some Python scripts that are doing topic analysis and, and some uh, um, uh, different analysis of the data. And done. 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and then it gave me this uh, template here, which I'm going to go ahead and hit refresh. And what this is doing now uh, is as each tweet is being picked up by Logic Apps, it's running through that the set of scripts that you can go party on and adjust and do whatever you want. The working data says big enough. Oh, there we go. We've actually, in this amount of time, because I have uh, MS Ignite uh, being recorded, we've barely hit the buffer uh, flow of number of tweets. But the, um, uh, and what this has done is it's pulled in um, an out-of-the-box brand uh, management dashboard for me, uh, tracking all of these different tweets. And so you can see I was following Azure and MS Power BI, and I can see how many tweets they're retweeting. Uh, but really my favorite feature here is when I go to the author hashtag graph. So these are all the different people who have been tweeting, and you can see MS Ignite and Azure, because obviously because of the, the uh, conference, I refreshed this right before we started. Uh, and what I can do is just filter down just to people who uh, tweeted with the hashtag, say Azure, MS Ignite, and Power BI, and just out of the box see the different clusters developing uh, of who's been tweeting about these different, um, different uh, um, hashtags. And I can actually drill down and see these specific users uh, and then uh, even see inbound tweets for who's tweeting at our different Twitter handles. And again, this took 15, 15 minutes to get set up. Uh, the best part being is, is me as a, a, a BI pro, I can either party with this here in the Power BI layer, uh, or if I switch over and I get to uh, the, the Logic App designer that's built behind the hood, uh, all the code and the different processes uh, for this are just mine to go take and, and to extend. And so uh, where we've seen the solution templates is, is partners and, and, and people with a, a BI Pro mentality have picked these up uh, and made something that's incredibly rapidly deployable that they can use uh, either internally or, or with some of their uh, downstream customers. Um, and so uh, if you have 15, 20 minutes, you got a Twitter account, you have an Azure subscription, I highly recommend you go click through this, use 30 minutes to kick through this template, uh, and you're going to be having some really fun dashboards uh, built really quickly. Um, so with that, if, if we didn't give you enough to get started between the web page, the five minutes to wow, the solution templates, I don't know what else we can do because you can get amazing value for, all, for e even no cost in many cases. So looking very much forward for you guys using Power BI and joining our community. Thank you. Fantastic. So thanks, Patrick. So this is really uh, you know, critical in some senses, the fact that you can go in and get started so quickly. Um, this is, you know, for us, really, really a critical part of what makes a BI platform successful. Gone are the days when you needed to go off and get some specialist, maybe you know, analyst or data scientist, someone like that, if you happen to be one of those, fantastic, because now we can go and reach many more people much faster. Your value of what you do really explodes because everybody in the organization can get to it. And we provide you these resources that, that, uh, that Patrick was talking about. In fact, the Power BI community, uh, which you just mentioned, you go to community.powerbi.com. Uh, we have literally over 100,000 active users there. So it's a very, very active community. You see thousands and thousands of posts by people. You can get questions answered and, and working. And it's just barely a few months old. It's a nascent new community, and it's thriving. I mean, it's really, really thriving. In fact, this evening, uh, we have a, a user group in Atlanta I'm going to go speak at. And it's, it's a great example of what you can do um, with Power BI I and mean, when lots of people are involved. And that's also the nice thing about great usage. When you have that kind of a hockey stick curve of usage going up, more people are involved and more solutions are being delivered that people can know about. The solution template, try it out for CRM, uh, for Twitter, for other things. It really is a fast way to get started, and it gives you the ability uh, to get not just 
uh, a simple dashboard, but to have essentially a data warehouse, uh, ETL packages, a workflow, all of these things are built for you and delivered to you so you can customize and deliver to your users in turn. It's a great way of, of getting uh, going very quickly. If you happen to be a system integrator or a partner of that sort, it's fantastic because now you can just go off and create offerings around this without having to spend your time and effort coming up with that offering. Microsoft provides you the support uh, to, make, to make this going. So that pretty much uh, is the extent of what we were talking about today. Um, a few more things to point out. If you want to do uh, more uh, with Power BI, here are some interesting sessions to go check it out. So please take a look. Uh, if you haven't marked them in your calendar, uh, go ahead and do so. Um, we have our boots. Visit them for sure. Uh, lots of stuff going on there. I'm told to put this up because it talks about your career path and starting with Azure and all those nice, cool things. Uh, so please go and look out the, for these resources. Uh, last but not least, in terms of evaluation, that's super important. Please do give us feedback on how things work. If you liked it, tell us. If you didn't, tell us. It'd be good to know. Uh, we have about you know, five minutes more. We can take questions if you want. Anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer them. Pardon me? Let me take questions down here. Okay, we don't want to do questions. Well, we can take questions here. We got the mics, right? If you want to take questions, more than welcome to do it here. Um, otherwise, we'll just wrap up and, uh, and, and move on. So I guess we're wrapping up. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. <laughs>